Welcome to this week's Insights with Eric Akopian. What we're going to be discussing this week is a very interesting three-hour-long interview the former president Serge Sarkisian gave last week on national television about his views about the Karabakh war from last year. I think he had very interesting and important things to say, and I think for those who are naturally inclined not to like him, I think it's important to hear people out, and in this case, given his experience and past position, I think we, we need to hear him out and see what he had to say about the war. And we should not dismiss it just because of our personal attitudes towards him. The first point that he made was that his reasons for wanting to stay in office post his presidential term in 2018 was to likely implement and reach a final peace deal on the Karabakh issue, which he claims was very close to being completed in the OSCE negotiations. Uh, frankly, this is something that we will never know exactly if it's true or not, and, and we will not know this for many, many years, because this is something for the historians to decipher and not for us to decipher today. However, this excuse for staying in power because of external threats is something that's been used by every totalitarian or authoritarian state or leader in this region. So I would be rather dismissive of this, uh, and I don't think it's something that was the primary reason that he wanted to stay in power. The primary reason that he wanted to stay in power was to continue the rule of his regime and the people that kept him in power and the oligarchic class. The second reason of note that he stated uh, in his criticism of uh, the current government was his handling of the peace negotiations. And I think we need to be very uh, careful and, and listen to what he's saying here, because I think he actually makes some good points. He criticizes the current government, the Pashinyan government, in its approach to the war in what he felt were provocations, whether it was his uh, insistence that Arabah should be part of the process uh, of changing the negotiating format or starting things new. Now, the truth is we will never know if these were the reasons that led to the start of the war, but we, what we do know is that these were the excuses that were used by Azerbaijan and Turkey to start the war. So I think the former president is correct. All of those moves and the provocations that were made by Pashinyan were not helpful to the process, and if they did not lead to the start of the war, they gave the other side a very good excuse to start one. The third point of note that the former president made was a rather startling claim that the 2018 revolution was actually an anti karabakh or anti karabakhzi movement. Frankly, uh, this has no basis in reality. Uh, the revolution, as he probably knows as well as anybody else, was supported by the overwhelming majority of the Armenian population in Armenia. And in fact, it was supported by many people in Artsakh itself. Uh, the support for this revolution was very wide. And there, in fact, there's a very broad consensus all across Armenian society about the importance of Artsakh and defending people there and the territorial integrity and what in the long run independence of the Artsakh Republic. So I think this was rather a cheap and uh, uh, unenlightening thing that he said that really had no basis in reality. The fourth thing that he said, which uh, amazed a lot of people and caused a big stir here, was about the use of uh, our advanced rockets and missiles. He actually made a startling claim uh, about the fact that Iskander missiles were used against Shushi in the, in the few days that there was fighting going on in the city, which would be a startling misuse of a weapon, given the nature of the fighting in Shushi and what the weapon is for. Furthermore, he went along and criticized not using these missiles earlier to attack strategic targets inside of Azerbaijan. And I think this is a very key point here. Uh, for us to understand. The Iskander missiles are an advanced missile system that Armenia has that has the ability to target pretty much anything in Azerbaijan within a meter of its targeting. So these are very effective and very exact weapons. Uh, there were many people during the war that were advocating for our side in order to end the war to hit strategic targets is in Azerbaijan. So I think the former president might actually be onto something here. Now, the one caveat here, which we will never know, is there's a lot of discussions between countries, threats that are made, promises that are made, and this is something that usually doesn't come out until you read history books 20 years later. But as a matter of principle, I think his approach, especially if we had gone after the economic targets of Azerbaijan early enough, could have had the effect of ending this war, and this was something that was discussed. So he could actually be very correct on this point. 
uh, especially when you understand the nature of the Azeri economy, which is gains 90% of its income from one source. In fact, there's really no such thing as the Azeri economy outside of its oil resources. So any attack on those facilities, one, would have devastated the country economically, at least in the short term. And secondly, brought in the interest of a lot of Western powers who, could, who, could, who did not care about the outcome of this war or the war crimes that were being committed against the people of Artsakh. As would any politician or former elected officials who give their commentary on today's issue, uh, what they don't say is almost always more revealing than what they do say. So after listening to the president's interview, I have a few questions for him. Uh, in the past 10 years, he has led the country for eight of those years, which means for the most part, the army that went to war last year was the army that he created and an army that he led. So my question for him is, how come the army that you left behind for this new current government was not prepared to go to war? How come the army did not have the latest weapons? More importantly, why did it not have offensive drones and better anti-aircraft systems, which we know would have changed the outcome of this war? Furthermore, a second question for him is, you actually went through a live fire exercise in April of 2016, which in hindsight was really just a preparation for this war. They were essentially testing what we were capable of, our defensive systems, and what would happen in a larger war, which came four years later. What did you do in those two years between 2016 and 2018 to learn those lessons of the April war and to improve our defenses? As far as we know, not very much. The third question that I have for the former president is in the 10 years that you led the country and you led the army, what did you do to create a meritocratic system in the army that rewarded excellence, punished corruption, and make sure that the most competent people are placed where they need to be in running the army? My fourth question for the former president is, can you really honestly say that the culture of incompetence and corruption, and more specifically corruption, that your, for, your regime was involved with for 10 years, was not responsible for weakening the country, weakening the army, and putting us in a position that we would lose this war. And let me give you a very personal example of this. Uh, I will never compare the former president to Erdogan, because regardless of any of his faults, uh, he is not a totalitarian leader like Erdogan, uh, who is militaristic, racist, and starting wars in all of his region. Our former president was much better than that. But let me give you an example and a comparison of the son-in-laws, as I call it. Uh, many people don't know this, but the famous Turkish Bayraktars are actually started and owned by the son-in-law of President Erdogan. Obviously, he received lavish state subsidies and had gotten rich off of his relationship with the president and with the state. But what he did at the end of the day was something that was quite useful to his country and quite detrimental to us. Our former president's son-in-law did not create a drone company, but he owned a chain of coffee shops. Good, but certainly not as useful to his country as what Erdogan's son-in-law did. At the end of the day, what I have to ask all of our leaders, former ones and current ones, is, is this. One, are you willing to take responsibility, first of all, for what happened? And two, are you willing to give us a vision of where we need to go? Finger pointing in this society only belongs to citizens and it does not belong to our leaders. Today, we learned that given the number of missing in action that we have, we might end up having somewhere between four to 5,000 casualties in this war. Those are horrendous numbers. And the parents of those kids are not looking for excuses and they're not satisfied by finger pointing. So what I would urge our former leaders and our current leaders is you either lead, show us a vision, or stop speaking. That is the least that you can do to honor the martyr that, that we have lost. Thank you for joining us with this week's Insights with Eric Akopian.